Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back here in the Blaue Saal. A welcome to our physical, actual physical audience again. Uh, we're really happy to be back. Um, uh, it's, it's great to be back after all this time, after a prolonged online period. Um, but of course, we're also still living in a bit of a uh, twilight hybrid zone. So also a very warm welcome to our viewers watching online. For those of you here in the room, is, uh, is there anyone for who this is the first actual Studium Generale program that you're attending? Oh, I see quite a few hands. Oh, that's great. We're really happy that you were able to find us after this online year. Um, so, uh, yeah, great that, you, uh, that you're here with us. We wanted to uh, kick off the new year in style, and uh, we're very honored uh, and excited to have with us today Professor Ewine van Dishoek. Um, she has been descri described as an uh, astrochemist rock star. And I quote, this is not my own invention. Uh, she's certainly a world leader uh, doing pioneering work on the boundaries of astronomy, uh, molecular physics and chemistry. Uh, now, our university is celebrating its uh, 65th uh, uh, anniversary this year. And uh, the theme is Heroes Like You. And I think Evine is certainly a hero to uh, many aspiring students and researchers. Um, she studies one of the most interesting questions there is. Is life possible on other planets or are we alone in the universe? She has helped develop the most powerful telescopes on Earth to address these questions. Um, and her research has helped to better understand the chemistry of interstellar clouds, which is sort of where the magic happens and I'm sure is what we will be hearing a lot more about today. Um, Ewine van Dishoek is Professor of Molecular Astrophysics at Leiden University. Uh, she has won many awards for her research, uh, including the Spinoza Prize, the Dutch uh, Prize for Science, the Albert Einstein World Award for Science, and the Kavli Prize, uh, which you can compare to the Nobel Prize for Astronomy. And to very least, recently she was president of the uh, International Astronomical Union, um, and today she is here with us. I'd just like to mention, if you have questions for Evina during or after her, her lecture, uh, you here can raise your hand, and for our online viewers, you can post your question in the chat, and we will make sure to address some of those after the talk. Here to answer the age-old uh, question about life, the universe, and everything, please welcome Evine van Dishoek. <laughs> All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so great to be here live, and so great to see you live here in the uh, audience. And of course, also those of you who are viewing online, uh, welcome as well. I hope that all of you are doing well in spite of all the difficult circumstances that we are still having. But simply the fact that we can now meet here in person is already a big, big, big step forward. So my talk today is going to be about uh, astronomy. And uh, I realize that that's not a topic that is uh, on the curriculum here in, in Eindhoven. But I hope to, to, to take you a little bit on a, a, a tour through a part of the universe and where we are going to look at how new stars and planets are being born and, and maybe also uh, life that could arise on them. Um, but before I start there, I want to really uh, pay tribute. Oops. Let me just see here. Tribute to the people that make this uh, all possible, which is basically young people like you. And they are doing uh, the research uh, in uh, my group and I and other groups. And I'm being very fortunate to have a very uh, lively uh, and passionate group of students uh, to work with over these various decades. So a big tribute to them as well. Okay. So, uh, life, the universe, and everything was the title that I was given. So, in 25 minutes, obviously, we cannot talk about everything. So, that's why it's not everything. But I'd love to at least give you a little taste of what is uh, out there and, and how basically we, uh, our solar system, also uh, originated from some of these dark clouds that you see over here in the uh, Milky Way. So, speaking about the Milky Way and about everything, um, you only have to look up. And a beautiful night, probably going to be tonight. Uh, you know, find a dark spot, look up at the night sky. It's available to everybody, everywhere in the world. Um, and when you do that, you can even do it with social distancing, as you see over here. Um, then 
undoubtedly at some stage you start to wonder not only about the beauty of the night sky, but also, well, where do we actually come from? And what is our place in that gigantic uh, universe? And these are questions that fascinate not just astronomers, not just scientists, but you see it all throughout society. Um, you see it, uh, for example, in the arts. Uh, one of my hobbies is astronomy and art. Uh, of course, as a Dutch person, you don't have to go very far. You have Vincent van Gogh, who, who just had to uh, paint the, the starry night as he writes to his brother Theo. Um, but you can go to another part of the world, to uh, Australia, the Aboriginals, they have this beautiful southern sky uh, above them, and there the Milky Way dreaming is an integral part of uh, their society. Um, and so you see that uh, throughout the uh, world. Okay, here we have our beautiful Milky Way and the night sky. You see here the large Magellanic Cloud, one of the nearest uh, galaxies uh, also. But let's now suppose that we could actually step out of our galaxy and look down on it. And then it would look something like this. Um, it is a, a, what is called a spiral um, galaxy. Uh, see here the spiral structures. Uh, here is the center of our galaxy. We now know that there is a, a, a supermassive black hole actually in the center of that galaxy. That was the Nobel Prize uh, last, uh, last year. Um, but our star is actually only just one of some 250 billion stars in the Milky Way. And it's a quite ordinary star, and it is somewhere in the outskirts here of, uh, of our Milky Way. And so, uh, you know, this whole question of are we alone um, already is being put in perspective by the fact that we live on a, a pretty small rocky planet uh, around a quite ordinary star somewhere in the outskirts of our galaxy. Um, and then uh, our Milky Way is also only one of hundreds of billions of galaxies. And here is one of the deepest images of the universe that was ever taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And every little uh, uh, image that you see here is, is not a star, but is actually a, a galaxy very far, far away. Um, and say our galaxy would look something like this on an image like that. It's already a quite mature galaxy. But it's just to show you that uh, um, everything I'm going to talk about here, uh, even though I'm looking in the neighborhood of, of our own sun, in the neighborhood... Uh, just this region of our own galaxy, it's, it's very universal. It happens in all the, the galaxies throughout the, the universe. Now, one of the most exciting discoveries in uh, astronomy uh, and developments over the last 25 years has been the discovery of planets around other stars, planets around other stars than our sun. Um, we call them exoplanets. And how do you find them? Well, you can either find them when the planet goes in front of the star and dims the light of the star a little bit. A few years ago, Venus went in front of our sun, and that also resulted in a tiny little dip of the uh, um, intensity of, uh, of the sun. You can also see it by the motions of the, of the star, because uh, an unseen planet, um, say Jupiter in our own solar system, tucks a little bit on it, and that means that the uh, star is not completely um, at rest. Um, and so our sun also mo uh, moves a tiny little bit due to the pull of, of, of Jupiter and uh, Saturn. And with these techniques, now over the last 25 years, we know now actually that planets around other stars are common. Uh, was of course always philosophized for, for centuries already that you know, there would be planets around other stars. But now we know actually that on average, every star has at least one planet. And we also know that there's a big diversity. And there are very big planets like Jupiter, there are very tiny planets like Earth. Uh, but surprisingly, the bulk of the planets, exoplanets, are of a type that we don't have in our own solar system. We have eight planets in our solar system, uh, but we don't have the so-called super-Earth or mini-Neptunes, a few, few times the mass of the, uh, of the Earth. And this then raises, of course, the question, how were they formed? How unique is our own solar system? And what is the composition uh, of these other uh, planets? Uh, could they be habitable? And so 
uh, that started out as a, uh, a study that was primarily concerned with our own solar system. This big question as how we were formed some four and a half billion years ago uh, has now a direct relation also with the possibility uh, for life also on other planets. Now, in our own solar system, we also get quite a bit of information of about what happened some four and a half billion years ago. Uh, we get that uh, in the inner solar system from uh, meteorites. Uh, meteorites come from asteroids. Uh, there have been some missions just recently. Uh, the OSIRIS-REx mission, for example, that went to asteroid Bennu and picked up a little bit of the material and brought it back uh, is bringing it back now to an, uh, a laboratory uh, study in a laboratory on Earth. In the cold outer solar system, you have not just rock, but you have actually a mix of rock and ice. Uh, that's what a comet is, a dirty snowball, as we uh, also call it. Um, that, uh, and there we had the excitement of the Rosetta mission from the European Space Agency actually landing on a comet for the first time uh, in 2014. And these objects are, are typically a, a few kilometers in, in diameter. So think about it, trying to land on a comet <laughs> far, far away that is just a few kilometers in, in diameter. Uh, any case, the, all the information that we get from these bodies, they are basically messengers from the early solar system. They tell us something about what happened in the past. Okay, so let's see actually where stars and planets are formed because uh, basically, you know, our Earth, uh, the ingredients that we have, they come from the space that is in between the stars. I mean, you look up at the night sky, you know, you of course see all these stars. You may see a constellation like this. Do you re does anybody recognize this constellation? Orion, yes, very good. Um, so, Orion we have here, and uh, with a small telescope you can already see, even with binoculars, you can see this, this little nebula here in the sort of Orion, that's the Orion uh, nebula, and the message is basically that that space between the stars, usually people don't think about it, but it's not empty. Um, it's filled actually with a very, very, very dilute uh, gas. And the denser concentrations of that gas we actually call uh, clouds. Think about like clouds we have in our own atmosphere. And one of the most famous ones is here, the, the Orion Nebula. And uh, these clouds are important because they are actually the place where new stars and planets are being born. You see it here in a, um, a little movie, an image actually of the uh, Herbal Space Telescope, the Carina Nebula. And uh, you see the clouds here actually as dark regions against a bright background. And see here you see a dense cloud. And if I would point my telescopes here at this dense cloud, uh, that is where I would see that new stars and planets are being formed at this moment. Now, these clouds are big. They are several light years uh, across. They are also very cold, only just uh, 10 degrees above absolute zero. They're also very empty. Even when we call it as an astronomer a dense cloud, <laughs> it's only of the order of 10,000 particles per cubic centimeter. And so think about how much we have here in this, this room. We have some 3 times 10 to the 19 particles per cubic centimeter. And even a good ultra-high vacuum in one of your laboratories here on campus is still of the order of, say, 100 million particles per cubic centimeter. So what an astronomer calls a dense cloud is clearly much more empty than we're, we're used to. That's, of course, interesting. That it gives us a, a unique laboratory to work with. Now, in that laboratory, we have gas, uh, but we also have dust. And these dust particles play a very important role. So think of them as little grains of sand. Uh, they are mostly silicates. Uh, but then only a tenth of a micrometer, so um, um, basically uh, still uh, significantly less than, say, a human hair uh, width. And these dust grains are important because they actually absorb and scatter the radiation. Why do these clouds look dark on this image? That's because these dust grains, just like uh, smog in the atmosphere, uh, absorbs the radiation and scatters it. Um, so, in that doing so, they actually also protect molecules. 
uh, from the dissociating UV radiation, because of course stars uh, have a lot of ultraviolet radiation, uh, but they protect the molecules actually from them. And as we will see, they also provide a place for, for catalysis, but not catalysis in the uh, traditional sense, chemical sense, uh, more a catalysis of, of meet and greet each other, and in that way form a molecular bond. So let's... Uh, uh, look in a little bit into the, the chemistry that we actually have in space. So, you're all familiar with the periodic table, but if you ask an astronomer what does your periodic table look like, well, it consists mostly of hydrogen. Hydrogen made during the Big Bang, uh, together with a little bit of deuterium and a little bit of helium. Helium, of course, doesn't do much chemically as a noble gas, um, so it's mostly hydrogen. And then later after the first generation of stars, um, through nuclear fusion, you make out of hydrogen and helium, you make the, the elements that are interesting for us, the elements that make us uh, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and also the second row here of the periodic table. Um, but if you look at that by number with respect to, to hydrogen, then they are only uh, a fraction of a promille, actually. And so, what we have here is actually a cloud consisting of gas and these dust particles. Uh, very cold, very empty, mostly hydrogen. And so, you know, atoms and molecules may encounter each other maybe only once in 10,000 or 100,000 years. So as a chemist, you would say to an astronomer, don't even bother looking for molecules because you won't find them under these very unusual conditions. Um, but that was actually the surprise. Uh, astronomers didn't listen to chemists. They started tuning their telescopes, uh, their receivers in the 1970s, and uh, they were actually surprised to find one uh, molecule after another. And in fact, it turns out that there's a very rich chemistry in interstellar clouds. How do we measure that? How do we detect molecules? Well, basically through their, either their rotational transitions, their pure rotational transitions, um, through the laws of quantum mechanics, uh, the molecules rotate and vibrate. So we either see the rotational transitions at millimeter wavelengths like you see over here, um, and, uh, or we see them through their vibrational transitions, which are at infrared wavelengths. So it's really observations are primarily at infrared and at uh, longer uh, millimeter uh, wavelengths. And what kind of molecules do we find? Well, more than 200 different molecules have already been found. Very simple molecules like carbon monoxide, water, as you see over here, but also more complex molecules uh, were readily found. Uh, methanol is, is, is actually very abundant. Uh, here, dimethyl ether, methyl cyanide, uh, molecules that we, we readily detect in less than a minute integration time in a cloud like uh, uh, Orion. And this molecule that also many of you may know, and this is of course ethanol, um, is also available in, in quite substantial amounts in interstellar clouds. Um, I think a, a cloud like Orion will have enough alcohol to fill some 10 to 27 bottles of whiskey, just to give you an indication uh, of that. Uh, the only thing, it's not 40%, it's, it's more like <laughs> 1% with respect to water. Uh, but still, there's, uh, there's, if, if you are in need of a little beer, then uh, you could go and, and tap one uh, out, of a, out of a cloud over there. Now, people are also searching for even more complex molecules. We know that these molecules, the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, are present in interstellar clouds in quite substantial uh, amounts. Um, but the simplest amino acid, uh, glycine, has not yet been firmly identified. Um, and this is, of course, important if you start thinking of the, the origin of life. And this little molecule that some of you may recognize, uh, that's caffeine, uh, maybe not necessary for origins of life, but still pretty important for maintenance of life, um, that, that has also not yet been detected. Um, but the point is that these molecules are not that much more complex than what we have seen already. And so it's a, it's a matter of, of going deeper and deeper uh, with new technology uh, to unravel the full uh, compounds. And to sort of connect with the life part of the title, once you have these 
even relatively simple molecules like formamide, uh, which we see in quite large abundances in interstellar clouds, if you let them react on a young planet with clay, uh, minerals, uh, etc., these silicates, which we also know are, are present there, um, then laboratory experiments have shown that you can get quite readily here to amino acids, to bases, uh, um, etc. And, and ultimately then, uh, perhaps live, at least these molecules form sort of the, 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 the building blocks uh, for building that. And there's here in the Netherlands uh, quite a lot of research actually going on on origins of life, uh, both from the chemical perspective, from the physics perspective, from the biology perspective, from the geology perspective, and from the astronomy perspective. And all of that is, is, is actually coming together in something like the, the origin center uh, that is in the Netherlands. In Leiden, we actually have our own laboratory for astrophysics, where we try to simulate these, uh, um, um, these conditions in space and these uh, experiments. The only thing we need to do is, is speed them up a little bit. We can't wait for 100,000 years, <laughs> so they, we have to speed them up to do them in a day. But uh, we actually have been very successful in, in sort of uh, creating and, and uh, making these same molecules under these conditions, these very cold conditions, especially on the surfaces of the interstellar uh, grains. And just to show you one example, how do we think that water is actually made in space? Um, you see that here as, as follows. Um, here you see uh, one of these interstellar grains, and maybe once a day, yeah, there it comes, uh, hydrogen actually lands on, yeah, there it comes, lands on the surface of the grain. It scans the grains, it finds another hydrogen, it goes off as molecular hydrogen. But it can also find an oxygen, the red ones, yeah, there it goes. Two oxygens can find each other. Molecular oxygen we make then. And now we're going to make hydrogen peroxide, uh, H2O2. And now we are actually making two water molecules. And uh, now we're going to speed up. We're going to move forward, fast forward, from a few days to uh, 10 to the 4 or 10 to the 5 years. And uh, now we're making basically this, this layer of ice actually uh, surrounding our cold interstellar uh, grains. And this uh, uh, mechanism actually for making water has been simulated in the laboratory, it has been simulated theoretically, and it has also been confirmed through observations in space, including seeing several of these intermediates like the hydrogen uh, peroxides. Um, and so that is why we also say that the water uh, that we actually have in space uh, is actually older than the sun itself. Because most of the water that you see here on Earth, in your body, in the, in the uh, ponds that you have over here, um, that actually those water molecules are some four and a half billion years old, uh, formed in the cloud out of which our solar system collapsed. So think about that the next time that you take a little sip of water, <laughs> that you're drinking something that is uh, four and a half billion years uh, old. Actually, this movie is made here on campus uh, in the, um, uh, in the uh, animation lab uh, here of uh, Professor Bert Meyer. So very good. So um, we measure the signal of water with our telescopes like Herschel. And uh, uh, we have measured here that in this case, there are some 6,000 oceans of ice available actually for building planets. Uh, in uh, planet-forming uh, disks that you see over here. From the strength of the signal, we can translate basically into the number of molecules that we, that we have there. And this has not gone unnoticed. Uh, even the Big Bang Theory has picked uh, this up, as you can see uh, over here. So to summarize this part of the talk, uh, we see that in spite of their very tenuous conditions, uh, clouds actually have a very rich chemistry. Uh, including water, including complex organic molecules. We see them around nearly every forming star throughout the Milky Way and by inference also in other galaxies. Um, and as we will see in a moment, there's also a large similarity with comets. In other case, it means that the building blocks for prebiotic material are widespread. Okay, a couple of minutes, something about technology, because I'm here at uh, a technical university, uh, because none of this would have been possible if we didn't have big telescopes, which have the most sensitive detectors and instruments attached to us. 
So the water observations were done with this, uh, the Herschel Space Observatory, the largest astronomical telescope that has ever flown with a diameter here of three and a half meters. And the Esron Institute has built a very sensitive instrument, the HIFI instrument, the water chaser. So uh, that uh, instrument was very good for water. If we want to study building planets, then we need another type of instruments because these disks are actually very small. Uh, what on this scale, they would be like, yeah, there it goes, a tiny little pinprick. So the disks are small, and so you need the sharpness of a new telescope that is called ALMA, the Atacama Large Medium Meter Array, in order to zoom in on this. So ALMA is a collaboration, the first worldwide collaboration between Europe, uh, North America, and East Asia to put 66 telescopes on a high-altitude plane in Chile. And why on this high-altitude plane? Well, the New York Times says it already. It's pretty high and dry uh, over there. Um, the transporter has been a little bit upgraded. So this is basically the transporter with which we put the telescopes. Uh, once they have been uh, commissioned, uh, we put them in the array uh, uh, at the top. So here you see actually also the logistics, uh, the te technological challenge of, of building such an array with telescopes, parts of telescopes, receivers, uh, correlators, etc., all coming together somewhere in uh, in 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 northern Chile, and then putting them together at 3,000 meters when your brain can still think, and then driving them upwards to 5,000 meters and putting them in the array. And I can say that it's truly a, a breathtaking experience uh, to be up there at the uh, high plateau. Um, Every antenna is actually equipped with a number of receivers. These are receivers actually with detectors that are at the quantum limit. And there are some of these eyes are also Dutch. Uh, they have been built here actually in the Netherlands through a collaboration of the Netherlands uh, Inst uh, Organization for uh, Scientific Research, uh, uh, NOVA, National Research School for Astronomy, and the uh, TU Delft. And here you can see then how ALMA, uh, actually all these telescopes work in concert and uh, they follow one uh, uh, object here over the sky as it, uh, as it transits actually over the sky, the dance at night. Good. In the final few minutes, um, I'll say a few words now about how from one of these clouds we actually form a solar system like our own. Because a cloud, like you see over here, can be stable for maybe a few million years. But ultimately, gravity takes over. And it will simply collapse under its own weight. And because it has a little bit of rotation, it means that material cannot, this angular momentum conservation, not continue to fall in radially, but part of it will come actually in a rotating disk around a young star. But that also means that all of our molecules that we made over there will now end up in that disk around the young star. And this is where the uh, planets are actually being built. And this is one of the first images that ALMA took of such a planet-forming disk. And we were just taken away, uh, uh, breathless, by the, uh, uh, by the interesting structure, actually, that this disk shows. Because we're now looking on the scale of our own solar system, uh, here at the orbit of Neptune, and we're seeing all this structure, and maybe this structure is due to planets that are already forming in the disk and that are sort of creating a gap here in this. Yeah, there they, you see it. They are attracting the gas and dust in their surroundings, uh, and uh, like a snowplow, they basically clear the area, and uh, that is what we can actually see, uh, this, this cleared-out area here. And that is now what we see in, in, in most of these disks around young stars. We see all this structure uh, now appearing on solar system scales, on scales of, of, of basically Earth's orbit scales. And that is uh, basically opening up now a new era of observational studies of planet formation. And to make a long story short is that we now know also that the ingredients for planet formation are common. Nearly all the young stars have disks and they have enough material actually in order to uh, um, build a new solar system. And in fact, the structures in these disks point to planet formation in action. So to wrap this up, um, let's go back to art. And this is actually an engraving from 1798 
that showed already that, well, there could be other solar systems, not just our own solar system uh, with seven planets at that time, but other solar systems that either have more planets or less planets closer by, further away, uh, a whole diversity of planetary systems. And that is basically the challenge now. How do we build these planetary systems? We find this enormous diversity, but how do we do that? Because, you know, we observe these, these planets, we observe the disks with their little dust grains in them, but, but how do we actually build them? How do we build, bridge some 13 orders of magnitude in scale uh, there and have to do that in just a, a few million years, a few tens of millions of years? That's the challenge that we have at the moment, and that we don't understand yet completely how in such a rotating disk that you see here of gas and dust where the, the little dust grains will actually collide with each other from time to time, how do we actually grow them from, from just a, a fraction of a micrometer to pebbles to, to somewhat larger uh, bodies, uh, etc. Here you see that nicely indicated where they actually uh, here come together, yeah, and you see them colliding and growing and growing bigger and bigger. Um, so this is basically how we think that it happens, but exactly the steps in between, not all of them are yet quantified. What we do know is that going from sort of these, these micrometer size, uh, pebble size, uh, centimeter size, uh, to something like comets, which are kilometer size, that's a critical step. Once we are at sort of kilometer scales, uh, then gravity starts to play a role again and we can grow to planetary embryos like Mars size, lunar size, and then build maybe something that looks like Earth. So that is why comets are such important study objects, because they are the building blocks of what made likely something like our Earth and the other planets. And uh, that was why the Rosetta mission was so important, because it actually had a mass spectrometer on board, a very sensitive mass spectrometer that actually sniffed the gases that were coming out of this uh, comet, had a very good nose, and it sniffed actually very much the same molecules that we also have in our interstellar clouds, very much the same. If you look here, a one-to-one -one correlation, both for the simpler molecules and the more complex molecules. So, um, we are studying now the building blocks of these new uh, solar systems. Could these worlds also be habitable? That's the big question. Uh, we know Earth is habitable, but Venus is not, and Mars is also not. Uh, all of them have a lot of CO2, uh, but only Earth shows also water, ozone, and other uh, biomarkers. And that's the challenge for the next uh, set of telescopes, uh, later this year, the James Webb Sp Space Telescope will be launched. That will be very sensitive, six-meter class uh, telescope, by far the biggest in space, astronomical telescope in space. Uh, and it will again have an instrument on board that has a, a Dutch-built Dutch instrumentation uh, uh, there. Uh, a little bit later, the extremely large telescope on the ground, 39 meters diameter. Think of it, 39 meters. <laughs> have a mirror of that. It's enormous, all the way up to there. Uh, and again, uh, the Netherlands is leading, actually, the building of uh, an instrument uh, there. And you saw, see here the, how, what a fantastic the animation of what the, the LT will look like in northern Chile. Let me end with uh, two powerful images. Earthrise, which many of you will have seen, famous image from Apollo 8, and this one, the pale blue dot. Uh, Voyager 1, uh, that took it 30 years ago, uh, looked back when it was already past Saturn, looked back at Earth, and that, that's, that's us. That's our little dot. That's home. Science, astronomy, very exciting, very lots of inspiration. But what we provide also is some perspective. Uh, a little bit of a sense of vulnerability, if you look at this little dot there. Also some modesty, and also tolerance. That says, please take care, well care of our planet, if you look at it like that. So, I hope to have given you a flavor of our origins in space, and uh, I'd like to end with saying that uh, we're all world citizens under the same beautiful sky. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Evina, for this uh, very fascinating talk. We have a few minutes left for some questions. I could think of a lot of questions myself, but <laughs> I would like to give the floor to either our physical or our online audience. 
is there anyone who would like to have uh, ask a question right right now? Yeah, uh, there is a mic. Uh, it's coming to you. I have to say, you you will be audio audible in the live stream, but not visible. So I hope that's okay. Yeah, well, thank you for your talk. Um, I was just wondering, like, if we want to measure molecules on Earth, we already need devices. So how can you measure molecules, like, light years away? <laughs> <laughs> well, they, uh, they emit photons. Um, of course, they are shifted in frequency with respect to Earth because the, the interstellar cloud moves with respect to Earth. So what you need to know is the, the velocity of that, that particular cloud, uh, star-forming uh, clouds uh, where you're looking at the molecules, but that's usually very easy to, to, to measure because the carbon monoxide line is, is by far the strongest line and uh, you recognize it immediately and uh, that gives you the velocity of that cloud with respect to Earth. Then you can shift all the frequencies basically to an, an, a laboratory Earth-based uh, frequency scale and you can just look up in the catalogs uh, which molecule you have. It's very, very accurate spectroscopy in, in microwave. It's uh, an accuracy of one part in 10 to the seventh. And we usually have not just one line, we usually have, uh, you know, methanol, we may have 100 lines that all fit exactly that frequency. So, um, so with, uh, of the 200 plus molecules, we are really secure that's, uh, that we know exactly what we're looking at. That's not the case for the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. That's vibrational spectroscopy, and that's much less accurate. Uh, yeah. You only have to sort of the, um, uh, the, the vibrational mode, but not, not the exact structure of the molecule. I'm Amazing. sure you, you, you. you must have one of the most remote labs <laughs> of, of biochemists or organic chemists. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe astronomers for them. Let's go to an online question. Um, there are quite a few coming in. Um, someone is asking, would it be possible to sort of harvest the hydrogen of the clouds such that it would be usable on Earth for energy production? Ah, I think <laughs> this must be a TUE student or a Yes, yes, yes. Well, there's, a, there's plenty of hydrogen out there, yeah. obviously. Uh, but uh, and I, I wish that we could uh, take a, a spaceship and go to the Orion Nebula and, and uh, harvest it there. But that's not yet in the books. Um, I mean, there are certainly people that want to go to the moon to harvest uh, some of the um, uh, raw materials there, I mean, which includes water. Um, and which includes also some of the other um, um, rare elements, uh, maybe some helium, etc. Um, but whether that is really more effective than what we can have here on Earth, I think is still to be determined. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks. Any other questions in the room? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, yeah. I remember reading this article that said like... Um, all the stars in the, in the universe have already been born. And so is that, I think this, the article was in 2012. Is that still the case like now? Do we still think that like all the stars are already born and like not many new ones will be made? Ah, you, you mean whether all the stars have already been born? Uh, fortunately not, no, <laughs> then the, because then our... Uh, you would be uh, absolutely... Yeah. <laughs> then, uh, then at some stage we would become a sterile uh, <laughs> um, um, galaxy. Uh, no, I mean, if you, what, what you see here in the Milky Way, that's the material, that's the raw material out of which new stars are being born. At this moment, still, there's about one sun-like star... Uh, being born uh, in the galaxy uh, per year. So that's the, the rate. So our galaxy is already a pretty mature galaxy. It has transferred most of its gas and dust into stars. Um, there are other galaxies that we're looking at, especially in the early universe, where there is much more gas and dust still, and where the uh, star formation rates, the formation, rate of formation of new stars is a hundred to a thousand times larger than what we have currently in the Milky Way. So, um, so yeah, it's a good point. Uh, fortunately, uh, stars uh, uh, are still being formed. The stars die, of course, also, and then they return their material to the interstellar medium. So, so that's what enriches then the uh, interstellar medium again with uh, the, um, the, the heavy elements that were synthesized in the, the previous generation of stars. Okay, thanks. I see we're um, uh, almost on time, but there are so many questions. I would like to... Maybe ask you to give a short answer on two more. The first of which is, is there a specific reason why our solar system has so many planets? 
age versus the, the one average that you described? Yeah, well, that's a good question. Uh, we don't know yet. Uh, we haven't, uh, interestingly, even though we now know of more than 4,000 exoplanetary systems, uh, there's not one yet that looks like our own solar system. And indeed, our solar system is, uh, is sort of among the somewhere 15% or so of uh, uh, exoplanetary systems that uh, have a, a Jupiter-like uh, giant planet. So in fact, we have more than one giant planet, so it is already a bit unique. Uh, we haven't found the twins uh, We can yet. still feel unique on our solar system uh, we, we, well, with reason. We think, yeah, we think that it's, uh, uh, the, the, the disk out of which it must have formed must have been quite, quite massive. That, uh, okay, great. Then the, the final question is, um, let me see, based on your remarkable expertise and work, what are your personal beliefs on extraterrestrial life? <laughs> well, that's a good one, yes. Um, it depends also on what you define as life. Do you define life as, you know, uh, intelligent life like we are? Or do you think just of bacterial uh, uh, microbes? Uh, what we know of our own uh, uh, Earth is that... Uh, single cellular life arose very quickly after its formation. And I think that must have happened elsewhere in the universe as well. On the other hand, it took a very long time for multicellular life to, to evolve. And the steps that are involved there are much more complex than, um, than forming uh, single cellular life. So, so I think uh, that's certainly still an open question. On the other hand, <laughs> just looking at the statistics, <laughs> that's, uh, yeah. they are certainly in favor of, uh, of there being also <laughs> uh, uh, life elsewhere in, in various different forms in the universe. Okay, yeah. great. Um, Irina, thanks again very much. We have to wrap up because some people, of course, also have to go to their next class. So thanks again, Irina van Dishoek. <clears throat>